A brand new season of Fanatec GT World Challenger at powered by AWS Endurance Cup starts not in Italy for a change, but here at the Circuit Paul Ricard outside Le Castellet in the south of France. Qualifying coming up and a three hour race in the daylight late afternoon, starting at 3 p.m. local time later on uh, with six hours of action, not at Paul Ricard this year, but at the end of the season uh, in the new venue of Jeddah, new for SRO Motorsports Group, that is. John Watson and David Addison, trackside, we're looking forward to the three-part qualifying session that's coming up very shortly. We're also looking forward to seeing who comes out on top because it's a really different looking entry. We've had drivers switching brands, switching teams, indeed switching championships, and so it's got a rather different look and feel to it. Some names you'll be familiar with. Car livery is not necessarily the same. Here's a significant change because although Maxi Martin and Valentino Rossi are together, this year, what's it? They have Raffaele Marcello with them in the BMW. And Hup hasn't done them any good so far. I'm waiting to see much the Matt Marcello magic. We all know what he can do when he was racing for those seasons back in the Mercedes AMG GT3s. And waiting to see what he can do in the 46 BMW for WRT. But there are some usual suspects there in the 98 Rover Racing BMW. Uh, and of course, the Mercedes, as we look at the 48. And that is, of course, the man filter, but Mercedes AMG team, Lucas Auer, Maro Engel, and Daniel Morad. One of the cars you might think right now is going to be looking strong for qualifying, along with, in particular, the number two, the Mercedes AMG team as well, the Get Speed operation. Jules Gonon, Fabian Schiller, and Lucas Stoltz. Two very, very strong lineups. We have a new pole position award, courtesy of uh, Rover, which is the uh, official oil now of the championship. Uh, also new for this year, Lamborghini, not just in terms of cars on track in greater number, but they will be the safety car and leading car providers. Uh, we also have a new driving standards advisor, that's Mika Salo, uh, who does the whole championship. And a new car here, the Ford Mustang, that has already become a Watty favourite, not just for the look, John, but for the sound. It's thunderous. <laughs> it is magnificent. It's what a rating engine should sound like. It's noisier than what he is, I tell you, so it's a good thing. Uh, it sounds mega, absolutely mega. The green light goes on at the end of the pit lane, and we are in business for Q1. Not many takers, lots of the cars still up on the stilts. Uh, it is just 15 minutes. Each driver must do a session. There is one two-driver entry, and driver one doubles up as driver two, so the car doesn't sit out a session this year. It goes twice in order to secure the average, and that is what we're looking at. It's the average time of the three, so we'll be talking about Q1 or Q2 or Q3 in isolation, uh, but the order of that doesn't necessarily reflect the grid order uh, because of needing to take the average in mind. Yannick Mattela there is good to go in uh, number three. Mercedes that he shares with the British driver James Kell and with uh, Tony Bartoni. Adam Smalley will go first in 188, the Garage 59 McLaren, the reigning Carrera Cup GB champion. Uh, doing British GT and Fanatec GT endurance this year is the man from Southport. Right, the circuit's getting a bit busier. Uh, I say a bit, like, you know, four or five cars, but 54 will be out at some point, and therefore, John, traffic management, finding clear track space, utterly vital. Absolutely, and it's always been the case when you get a 55 car entry, regardless of the length of the racetrack, just finding a single clear lap to get your hopefully best effort combined is uh, sometimes maybe more good luck than it is good judgment. Nevertheless, you usually find the right people end up at the sharp end of the grid, yeah. and those that maybe aren't quite at that same level, they find their own natural level within that 55 car field. Reigning sprint champion, Ricardo Fellas Audi. Just had a quick look at as that gets set ready to go. And so now as the uh, cars are dispatched onto the circuit. It's getting a little bit busier. Number 78, Lamborghini goes through. That's one of the two Barwell entries, which is Antoine Dockin, Till Bechtel Scheimer and Sandy Mitchell driving that car. Antoine Dockin, uh, new to Barwell for this year, but he knows the track and he chases 25 Santa Lock Audi over the line. Uh, as ever, we have got perhaps the pro class, which always takes up the attention because that's where your most likely overall winners come from. But don't ignore gold, silver and bronze cups because the battles there are going to be every bit as intense. So Antoine Dockin comes down towards turn four. Low flat curbs here, but he rides one and that unsettles the car. Yes, yeah, we saw in practice in those two sessions, there was a pre-qualifying session and a free practice session that at certain parts of the corner of the circuit, you can see there again riding the curb, how, how stiff effectively these cars appear to be. And 
in the case of the, the Come To You Racing Aston Martin team, they had two of their cars quite heavily damaged. The rear of the cars that went off in the pre the session in the morning and then in the pre-qualifying session in the afternoon. And it, I just wonder, you asked me the question, is it a car issue or a driver mm. issue? Mm. And I think it's fundamentally, in the case of the Come To You Racing, maybe a little bit of inexperience, maybe not enough track time, whatever, for the drivers that went off track and damaged their cars. And if the cars are set, as you can see with the Lamborghini, it's quite a stiff setup where the car can lift a wheel as it runs a curb. Maybe that's where some of the problems are actually uh, emanating from. So the Barwell Lamborghini heads towards us. Barwell, another stalwart GT team. Uh, this the first Endurance Cup race staged without uh, Jerome Polycon's ASP team. Uh, but we do have Team WRT and AF Corsa stalwart teams and the other long-serving squad, Santaloc, which came into the championship in 2012, uh, having recently marked its 20th anniversary. So many of the names we're familiar with, but there are uh, four teams making their first Fanatec GT Europe start. Two Seas Motorsport, familiar from Gulf 12 Hours or British GT, Century Motorsport, British GT champions last year, Lion Speed GP and uh, Proton Competition, which it's almost a surprise given how long that team has been around, but uh, in terms of the Endurance Championship, it's good to have them on the grid. For WRT, that's the Oman Racing Team uh, BMW. Jens Klingman at the wheel of it. Of course, if it's the Oman squad. It will have Ahmad Alhathi as one of the drivers. Good to have him back in the SRO fold. And the third driver, uh, reigning international GT Open, the Igto champion, uh, Sam Dehan, having won that with Charlie Fagg last year. So there. Uh, Jens Klingman, looking as though this is going to put him top because he's got two purple sectors here, John. He has maybe losing a fraction of seconds in this last sector, the last couple of corners running close to the tail of the Mercedes, but he is going to go quickest overall, two purples, and arguably he's got three purples and he does go quickest overall, 153.8, that's a good lap from Jens Klingman in the BMW. And after two years of trying not to call Sky Tempesta McLarens or Mercedes a Ferrari, thankfully they've gone back to a Ferrari for this year. Uh, Eddie Cheever, along with Jonathan Hui and Chris Frog at the drivers. Eddie Cheever, as you can see, does Q1. Uh, the last time they were a Ferrari team, it was with the 488. Now it's the new 296. It's moved on, as Chris Froggart was explaining the other day. But uh, I think they're quite happy to be back with AF Corsa, back with a brand that they had great success with and looking pretty confident going into this year. They were the bronze champions, though, last year in endurance. Even though they didn't win a race, did enough on points to add it all together and come out on top. But there's a lot more optimism, perhaps, now with the Ferrari for the Sky Tempesta racing once more. There is Chris Froggart looking on. So... I think just simply, when I mean, they had the Mercedes, they went through about three different operations That's to right, find a yeah. way to get the car yeah. the way they want it. Whereas I think what they've got with the Ferrari, it's very much a turnkey operation. So I don't know how many options they would have if they weren't satisfied with the current delivery of service. But I think, as you point out, it's the more, I think, natural home for uh, Sky Tempesta. They had good success when they had the 488 Ferraris. Going quickly back to Maxime Martin, purple, purple. So BMW clearly, in these cooler conditions, seem to have their cars well dialed in. Now, there are lots of lap times being cancelled for track limit offences. Uh, we'll try and keep tabs on all of that, but there are so many. It's all automated these days. There's another team of people in race control, three of them, with uh, two laptops apiece. So they've got two camera angles. Uh, and when they see a car go over the curb or transgress the regulation on the track limits, they press a button, it delivers all the information, not only a photograph of the offence, but the time of day, the car, the driver ID, it's all connected. Maxime Martin, though, here, uh, finds a car spun ahead of him and traffic in the way. Yeah, now that last sector has been utterly compromised. Maxime Martin was on course to go quickest overall, so he goes actually third, but the middle, that final sector, while it's his personal best, it ought to be in a purple sector, but car, you see the Lamborghini, sitting stationary at the exit as he has come out of uh, Pont Village, uh, Virage du Pont. Red flag. I was going to say red flag just immediately because the car is not moving. Yeah. So that's the Grasso Racing, the second of their entries. Yeah, it is the number 19 GRT car that means it has got behind the wheel of it uh, Matteo Llarena, the uh, Italian driver, Matteo Llarena, facing the wrong way, new to the championship, new to the car, uh, trying to get it fired up, but because they're hot, Often these cars do not want to restart on the button. Sometimes give them half a minute or so, uh, and they will cool and then be better minded, if you like, to start up. But you can't really give it 30 seconds, given where it is. It's got to start now, well, otherwise somebody could collect it. We see the car sitting in the wrong direction, having come to a stop, which was not a natural stop. 
So we didn't see what was the reason for that. Did it, was it a driver error? Was it a mechanical problem? So the car is now rolling and it sounds like it's been fired up and is about to make its way. Well, it's going to have to go all the way around the lap to come back into the pit lane. If you're the cause of a red flag, you do lose your best lap time, but he hasn't done Has a lap time. Established. No. Well, will he lose it? Retrospectively. Retrospect, yeah. Possibly so. So Mattia Lalena brings the car back. He shares it with the Q80 driver, Haytam Quarioli, and the British driver, Hugo Cook. All right, let's go to 46, Maxime Martin. Yeah, but I had to back off massively for this yellow flag. Anyway. Yes, I saw that. All good. All good for the moment. P3. We are P3 now. Correction. Jens Kligman, P1, 538, Eddie Schiever, and you. Jens Klingman, Eddie Cheever, and there Maxime Martin is the top three. You heard Maxime and the engineers talking on the radio. Maxime explaining he had to back off for the yellow flag, back off massively for the yellow flag. Engineer calming him down, saying, it's all good, we're P3. Yeah, when you put a lap together, you know, you purple, purple, or early into the session, nevertheless, to have to bail out, partly because of the wave yellow flag, but it was the, the, the traffic, there were three cars directly ahead of Maxime Martin. They were all bailing as well, so he had no option but to do the same, and uh, the frustration clearly in Maxime Martin having done such a good job on the opening two se sectors, uh, then to have to throw it away in effect, albeit he's in third position. But that's not a representative time of what that car is capable of. And only 19 had been able to do a time. That stoppage coming with just under eight minutes on the board, it's round about the halfway mark, if you like. But what it does now do, yes, the session will be resumed and the time uh, will remain because you stop the clock when it's qualifying. But from eight minutes now, you've got to do an outlap. You've got to do a start-up lap. And you've got to make sure, John, that obviously any time that you do stays. Because if you lose oh, yeah. it for track limit offences, you haven't got the time potentially to have another go. And, and in that just under eight minutes remaining, you're going to have everybody on the track. Yep. Whereas in the opening minutes, there's only half the field or just under half the field. So it's going to be... Uh, this is the judgment teams make. They don't want to go out at the very earliest opportunity because they think maybe the racetrack needs to be sort of re-bedded in. Uh, although we've had a, another support event here, but that's on a different tyre manufacturer. And of course the cars are you know, nothing like the performance of uh, the GT3s. And now people are going to think, oh, we've got to get out now. We've got eight minutes, just under eight minutes. And this, an outlap's going to be probably around about two minutes plus. And yes, uh, is that a, a damaged wheel or a wheel coming off? I think it's about to come off. Yeah. 74 Ferrari it is that's limping back. That's the Kessel racing car of the British driver, John Hartshorn. And he'll be lucky to get that back, I think, without the wheel parting company, because that looks very iffy. Yeah, I mean, if he gets it back, there's going to be a significant... Is that a damaged wheel or is that a suspension? Whatever it is, anyway, uh, <laughs> Valentino's enjoying it. Uh, buongiorno. So... Valentino in good form. He's very happy with the pace of the 46 BMW. He'll be hopping into it. Whether he'll be the second or third driver, looks like he might even be the third driver. And we were saying yesterday that it's a different Valentino Rossi from that that we had two years ago. He's done more mileage. He's more experienced. That continuity now of same team, same car, same co-driver with Maxime Martin. You know, he's he's, he's a, a, a more complete driver. He's got the confidence after that win at Masano last year. Uh, he is uh, certainly racing at a greater level than he was two years ago. Yeah, I think he's, he's probably moved on from leaning into a corner, dropping your knee down with the, the skidder, the skid pad on your knee that you can mm. bounce through, which is what motorcyclists these days do. The level of grip a motorcycle has got is phenomenal. The angles they can tilt the bike down in a corner, just eye-watering. So he's not a racing driver. He's firmly attached into the seat, the seat belts hold him in a position where he and virtually he's got no movement what you don't want any movement and just adapting and changing to those kind of fundamentals between motorcycle and car racing uh, he's now i think a fully signed up mm. member of the motor racing car racing uh, club we're almost ready to get going i think uh, because the session will start on short notice antonia rankin is down in the pit lane for us and who has she found first up valentino rossi Valley, we've got colder conditions today what are you aiming for 
Allora, when it's a bit more cold, uh, usually you can go faster because uh, the engine is faster and also the tire have a better grip. But you know, in the quali here uh, is uh, um, really, really a question of lucky or unlucky if, uh, because you have a lot, a lot of car in the track. So you need to prepare everything, but after you, you need to have that bite of, of lucky to have, uh, to have the right uh, uh, lap, clear lap. So we will see, we will see and uh, we will try to, to start uh, in the top 10. Absolutely, and of course there's a lot of traffic out there on this grid. How are you going to avoid that? Uh, <laughs> Alors, you can go at the beginning, you can wait a little bit, you can wait a lot, but after, you never know what's happened. We, we will see, we will see. <laughs> Brilliant, best of luck, thank you. I think that's the phrase of the day, isn't it? We will see. It's the same in qualifying, it's the same for the first few laps of the race, it's the same in terms of are we going to get an interruption to the race with so much, we will see. Uh, but uh, certainly the BMW looking good thus far, I know we've only had a handful of laps, Maxi Martin looking strong. 74 Ferrari then has limped back to the pit lane, but I would be a little bit fearful for whether that rejoins qualifying even, and a car there in the pit lane with a problem as well. Yes, so... I don't know why that car looks like it's lost its uh, drive, whether it's an engine issue, mechanical, you know, transmission, we don't know. So a car being pushed and everybody having to make their way around it. But it's this now mad rush just under six and a half minutes remaining. So an night lap is going to be two minutes plus. And you're going to be lucky to get, depending on where you come out in this line, if you're at the very front, you'll get two clear flying laps, or not two clear ones, but two flying laps in. And it's this first of the three qualifying sessions is going to be a, a real Hobson's choice as to who can get that little bit of clear air and get the clear lap. Right now it's the number 30 BMW, Jens Klingsman, who has set that fastest time. We saw the Lamborghini having had it spin. Uh, we've also seen the damage on John Hartshorn's Ferrari. Contact between those two cars at turn 15 noted. So there's part of your answer, it yeah, was damage. No, that's why I didn't want to condemn the driver until we got further information in it. So it was a collision, a, a contact between two cars that resulted. Uh, and that's why sometimes it's better to not make a judgment until you get the full facts. Make a diplomat out of you yet. Oh, well, it's what the first time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Our man in Le Castellet. Right, out of the pit lane, most of port. Still a handful of cars yet to break the beam. 26 Audi is under investigation for being on the fast lane before being allowed so to be. 26 is the Santa Lock Audi of Alban Varuti, who was really good in GT4 last year. Ivan Klimenko and Hugo de Wilde, the Belgian driver. And they're going through Christopher Hauser. Now, Christopher Hauser, Ricardo Feller, Alex Arca in an Audi. The Audi might not necessarily be the favoured car anymore. It might be a venerable car in GT3 terms, but that's a combination of drivers that you would not bet against. Well, there's a number of drivers, particularly in the pro category, that you put a, a tick alongside their entry to say these are maybe your top six mm. choices as to who are going to be the likely pool sitters and are certainly top three on the, the winner's podium. Christopher Hauser at the wheel, recording greens. Have a look on that graphic of the timing tower. You will see on the very far right, just after the car number, the background of which reflects their class, bronze or silver or pro uh, or gold. But going to the next column, you'll see at the moment little either uh, yellow or green lines. That is a reflection of what they've done in sector one. Below it is sector two, below it is sector three. If it is yellow, they've gone no quicker. If it's green, it is a personal best. And if you see anything, uh, pink or purple, then that's really good because it's an absolute best. So anything that's got a big block of green on the far right or a big block of purple is well worth getting excited about. And Christopher Hauser then comes up towards the line and he goes through with everybody pouring across the line en masse now, really to go on to a flying lap. So the order shuffles, but it's towards the end of uh, this that we need to start to put that into an order. And look at that driving standards flag flashing over the uh, pit straight, 46, that's Maxime Martin. It certainly is, and there's another BMW, Dries van Thor, who's actually managed to get a quicker lap in than what was the quickest lap previously, Jens Klinsmann in the BMW. So right now, BMW, are, they're dominating. They've got the top four positions in this one session, so uh, they have certainly got something that is working. We heard them from Valentino Rossi, cool air is good for the motor. Just what Calorelli's gone faster, sector two. Good for the motor, a little bit more dense air is good for the aerodynamics. And if you can get your tyre temperature up in the cooler conditions, then you're going to have a very quick race car. BMW have got four very quick race cars. Adam Smiley, or Adam Smelly, 
Smalling. Smalling, Smalling, not Smalling, Smalling. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm too far back from the screen. So he's just popped there, McLaren. Uh, garage 59, McLaren up into, well, he was fifth. He's now sixth, because then Augusta Farfus is a four-car BMW in the top five. You're riding with Andrea Caldarelli, and he's done a personal best and an absolute best. So the 2019 champion coming up towards the timing line. This looks good for the Lamborghini. Is it good enough then? There's traffic around him, but he's about to break the beam, and Caldarelli will go through, but it doesn't put him top. It is only 28th then, so a bit mysterious all of that. It looked really good on paper with the sectors, and it was an absolute best, but the two personal bests perhaps just a reflection of how slow he'd been on his outlap. Well, the, the last sector is the one that nailed it, uh, because he, his personal best was a 52.7. That was his personal best. So he got a green sector for it, but it wasn't anywhere near the speed or the pace of the front-running cars. You'd be doing a 50, a mid-50 second uh, third sector to consolidate what you've done on the first two. Dries Van Thorn quicker again, 153.304 in BMW number 32. Ayanshin Guven has got the Porsche up to second there, number 22 Porsche. Ayanshin Guven, the Turkish driver, he is 0.172 of a second back. There he is, Ayanshin Guven uh, accelerating up now through Le Bose in the Schumacher CLRT entry. It's an amalgamation of a number of teams, the CLRT bit being the more familiar one, Com Ledegar racing team, Com Ledegar uh, champion, of course, with Rob Bell and Shane Van Gisbergen back in 2016. So Ayanshin Guven uh, with a good team around him, and he specialises in Porsches. This will be uh, a really quick car, I reckon, this year, with Larin Heinrich and Dorian Boccalacci as drivers two and three. Yes, this lap is just backed off that last sector, so he's going to go again. He was fractionally down the middle sector, six thousandths of a second, almost less than a blink of an eye, but... So he remains second, a personal best first and third sectors, but that keeps him still in second place. Maxime Martin in the BMW is still in third position, Frank Pereira, and then on it goes. Jans Klinsmann, who had been quite fastest overall, is in the pits now, he's dropped down to seventh, and that BMW domination, which we saw momentarily, is now being split up by Porsche, Lamborghini, and the McLaren. So Dries Van Thor, BMW, Ancient Guven, Porsche, Maxi Martin, BMW, Andrea Calderelli has just gone fourth in the Best of the Lamborghinis, and another one is behind him from Pereira. Then Dennis Marshall's Porsche 6, it's McLaren 7, it's BMW 8, 9 and 10. Klingman from Eng from Farfus. What about an Aston Martin? You've got to go a little bit further down. David Pittard, the very quick and underrated British driver, last year's Nürburgring 24 hours winner. He is 12th and he's the best of the Aston peddlers at the moment. Yes, that's a Falcon horse. Mm. Aston Nürburgring. It's hard to get your head around Falcon horse running anything other than... BMWs, but they've switched over now Q2 to will Aston start Martin. at 10, 12. Q2 will start 10, 12. The voice you've just heard is that of the race director, Alain Adon. The chequered flag is out, as you can see. Plenty of people pressing on, people rattling up the kerb there in 158. Uh, the McLaren you're looking at pressing towards the end of the lap, one of the three Garage 59 cars, this being the uh, entry for Mark Sanson, Lewis Proctor and Nicolai Hiergaard. Alessio Rivera bringing Ferrari number 51 up towards the timing line, 14th, and should be an improver. Let's just get him across the line. Two greens, uh, two personal bests then. Lucas Stoltz has taken the flag only 15th. He would be the one in the queue behind, unless Rivera can improve, and he doesn't. He loses that in the last sector. So Calderelli is still on his lap again, that middle sector, uh, just a quarter of a second down. He's made up a little bit in sector one, but I'm not sure this is going to see any further improvement for... Andrea Caldarelli in the 63 Lamborghini. Just another little bit of, I like to point this out. You know, I'm a big fan of the Ford Mustang. I think it just looks great, sounds great. It's been by a country mile, the quickest car down the straight, down the Mistral straight, 284 kilometers per hour, about six kilometers an hour quicker than anything else around it. Of course, then there's a reason for that. And uh, maybe some of it is aerodynamic. Maybe some of it is simply horsepower. When they get that package really working, as they, they will inevitably do, that's going to be a big force. From Pereira up towards the line, and sixth fastest he was. Adam Smalley has gone second after an absolute best in the last sector. From Pereira goes quickest of all, though, 153.241. So that's been a bit of a sleeper this weekend, hasn't it? It's been there or thereabouts, to use the dread phrase. But from Pereira, 63 thousandths of a second, quicker than anybody else. That's a good number to have if you're in a Lamborghini, isn't it? 63. It so is, 63,000's up. So, a lot of happiness in the 
Grasso Racing Team there is the Lamborghini. So excellent, excellent effort by Frank Pereira. Just got everything ticked the boxes on the last lap, and that's all that matters. He got the lap in, so he'll hand that car over. And it'll either be Christian Engelhardt or Marco Mappelli. I'm not sure if there's two they're going to put in the middle section. But that's a car that, based on the performance we've just seen, again, you've got to add to your potential list of a car that's capable of winning this three-hour event this afternoon. Yes, normally we come up with a short list of winners. It's a long list. This it's a long weekend. list, especially the opening, around, opening event. Yeah, and that's true across all the, all the classes. There, Charles Witt, his father, Eve, and next to Eve with the flat cap, his trademark flat cap, is Vincent Voss. Clearly, having started racing in Formula Ford for Andy Welch's team based in the northwest of England, the flat cap has become now de rigueur uniform. 19 Lamborghini pits after its earlier travails, after its spin. And the Kessel Racing team will try and sort out the John Hartshorn Ferrari so at least it can do Q3, even if it can't be done in time for Q2. I rather fear, though, that it won't be seen in the session, so it's down to the stewards to decide whether they're going to let that car uh, take part in the race from the back of the grid. Let's have a look at the order then at the end of Q1. From Pereira, the fastest, from Dries van Thor and Adam Smalley, going great guns in the McLaren third, from Ayan Schengouven and Maxime Martin fifth. Andrea Caldarelli sixth, then it's Marshall's Porsche seventh, from Dean McDonald, Jens Klingman and Philip Eng. Two more BMWs then ran out the top ten. Uh, eleventh, the Porsche, what else, of Klaus Backler from Augusto Farfus and then David Pittard in the best of the Astons, Eddie Chiva in the Sky Tempesta Ferrari 14th, that's the best Ferrari, 15th Alessio Rivera and 16th uh, Artur Rougier, so that makes his the best of the Audis, number 111 being the CSA racing car. Then Lucas Stoltz ahead of Julian Andler, Christopher Hauser and the Optimum McLaren, Oli Milroy taking driving duties in the first part of qualifying. 21st, Gilles Magnus from Ezekiel Perez Compact, Mauro Engel only 23rd from Matthew Drudy, Christopher Mies in the new Ford, Alfaisal Al Zubar, then Jürgen van Aultert, Vincent Abriel, Casper Stevenson, Adam Christodoulo, Arjun Maini. Uh, after that is then Max Janssen from Tenat Saturn Tirakul, reign British GT champion, Darren Lund 34th from Martin Kodrich, then Esteban Mutt, Cesar Gazzo, the list goes on, Yannick Mettler comes next. The slowest car, didn't really get a time in, the Matt Bell, John Hartshorn, Ben Tuck. Uh, Ferrari, which there has Matt Bell as driver one, so we'll double check who it was that had contact. If it was Matt, then uh, it's, I'm afraid, a big setback because he's one of the quick drivers uh, and uh, unable, it seems, therefore, to get a time in. So we'll get ready for Q2. And there you can see the calm before the storm. About a minute and a half before the green lights go on, but the fast lane is open, so the drivers can, if they want now, go down the pit lane and queue to try to get good track position. Well, taking, bearing in mind what occurred in the first qualifying session where we had the red flag, uh, people held back in the belief that the track would be better at the end of the, the session than it is at the start. So some managed to get out, get a quick lap in, and I think we might see more driver cars going out earlier than we saw in Q1. Indeed, so just the 15 minutes once again. And now, because we are averaging the times, what we have in the isolated session, Q2, will not necessarily be uh, the aggregated order. James Kell came out of Ginetta Racing in the UK in British GT. We saw him in World Challenge Europe last year. He, uh, for this season, joins... Mercedes AMG ranked, goes to get speed with Yannick Mettler and Anthony Bartoni, son of drag racing legend Tony Bartoni. Cars now do start to queue up in the pit lane. You've got the Lion Speed GP car of Florian Spengler, Patrick Kolb and Bastian Bus ready to go. Great sight. Look at that. The drone doing its bit. What a wonderful view. I've never seen a view of the whole yeah. pole car circuit or half the pole car circuit just as that one. And... Uh, yeah, that drone yesterday gave some brilliant pictures, uh, not only green in the flag, practice sessions, flag. but also in the races. Uh, and it's pretty quick as well. It was uh, up to fourth in the GT4 race yesterday at one point, the drone. It was, it was giving some great <laughs> well, pictures. I, mean, they, they, uh, I think people are surprised just how quick these things are. Yeah. Uh, green flag has been issued to the teams. You heard it on the radio in the background. So now the pit lane starts to empty. It's funny, isn't it? However much track time you give drivers, some still sit there in the pit lane. Look, it's hardly a car with the... Uh, wheels on because they're still in the warmers but they will put the tires on and send them out very shortly and the man they've got to try to beat of course from Pereira he was quickest in Q1 great effort he's with Antonio 
Frank, fastest in Q1 in the 11th hour. Was that a strategic move to avoid traffic? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, like always, you know, GT World Endurance is always quite uh, intense qualify. Especially this year, I think there is uh, more cars, you know, so it's even more difficult. And you always know that there's going to be a, a red flag. So you try to start immediately and later. But I really feel like the car was good. I think we did a really great job yesterday. We knew we have the, the chance to be in the front. But uh, for sure, when you have the feeling that you can be in the top three or four, you, you try. And uh, it was difficult because I couldn't really get a good lap because of traffic. I had to slow down a lot. And, and I asked if it was possible for the fuel and everything for the rest of the qualifier to do another lap. And, uh, and yeah, the tires were a bit old. But uh, anyway, I'm really happy for the, to start a season like this. Well, absolutely. It clearly worked out for the best. Congratulations. So, Frank Pereira is, for the moment, uh, with his work done. Now, he will wait to see what his two co-drivers can do over the course of their qualifying time and piece it all together. Frank Pereira with Marco Mappelli and Christian Engelhardt. A good driver combination. It certainly is. I mean, again, you have to look around and say, add this one to the list of cars that yeah. are potential, A, first of all, pool sitters. But secondly, have they got enough? over the period of three hours, consistency, no mistakes, no penalties for track limit abuses, no contact with other cars, particularly other categories, because the pro cars, if they get in contact with, let's say, a bronze car, with a bronze driver in it, then that the penalty will automatically go to the pro driver. So, track getting a little busier, but not much, interestingly. You can see from the drone, looking down, fabulous, that, giving you a great shot of how busy the pit lane is, and... All the personnel at work, the teams holding the cars until the optimum moment to release. The Paul Ricard circuit, a much, much busier racetrack these days, not only in terms of the cars on it this weekend, but in terms of the number of race meetings. And bearing in mind that for many, many seasons it was closed as a racetrack. It was so only a test circuit. Uh, car 74 enter his pit box, so all the time for, from car 74 deleted so far and is not allowed to join Q2 and Q3. So that's the car that we saw limping back. John Hartson bent up Matt Bell's Ferrari, entering its pit box, contravening a regulation. Uh, now, let's eavesdrop on Aston Martin, number 21. OK, so take it easy, first lap, and then build up your speed. Track clear. Okay. Matty Slismont, the driver, being given instruction by the Comtu team. Uh, Matisse Lismont shares that car with Charles Clark, who raced uh, to second in British GT4 last year, and Sam de Jonga, who I'm afraid put it off the road at the start of free practice yesterday morning. The Astons had a, a tough day yesterday. They seemed really, really nervous cars through turns one and two, that first S's. Yes, I mean, and also the, the spare parts uh, bin, the rear wings on both cars were damaged, and I suspect the diffusers at the bottom of the rear wing likewise were damaged. So, you know, a difficult start to the season for the come to you racing Aston Martin team having switched from Audi uh, and made a major commitment for cars here this weekend and in, in, in terms of the drivers behind the wheel more to do with inexperience I suspect mm. than anything else and also being you know, thrown in, in the deep end I don't know how much testing time any of the team members would have had uh, and if a car is set up in a way which is a, a quick setup let's put it that way uh, maybe it is on the more nervous side and then the less experienced drivers are going to be the ones that might find themselves getting into trouble. Are you looking at uh, Nicolo Schiro going way wide at Le Bose, rattling over the kerb on his way up towards Bendor and waiting to see whether that instigates any track limit warnings. But this is a man that's a good single-seater racer. Over a decade ago, he was the European F3 Open champion coming up towards the line. So Nicolo Schiro, who's... Uh, racing sports cars of late, the Mont Cup, um, prior to that, the Ferrari Challenge. Uh, so he knows what he's doing, but he was a little bit ragged out on track, as you've seen. He goes over the line, and uh, Nicolo Schiro then puts a lap on the board, and that puts the car second fastest at the moment, 154.814. What you have on the timing tower is the combined 
uh, times, in other words, the aggregate, uh, whereas we can also look on our screens here trackside at the isolated Q2 at the moment. Toby Sowry, the British driver uh, new to the championship, he's fastest there, 153.8, been racing in the States recently, Toby, but he's been a uh, Lamborghini Super Trofeo racer, MSV Formula 3 Cup champion a good number of moons ago, and the Century Motorsport BMW is the fastest. Right, John, Ford Mustang, it's all yours. So here we go, and it's, if you don't, like, don't, you don't like the look of the car, just listen to it. But I like both. I like the look of the car. It's really stealthy looking, and it's, it just sounds amazing. But it's the straight line performance this car's got that is the standout feature right now. Uh, and when the team get some more mileage, get accustomed to Pirelli tyres and all the things that they need to do to build performance, I mean, if you got the looks, you got the noise, and you got the pace, you got all the three boxes ticked. In my idea. There's the noise, he blasts past the camera, catching the Mercedes, the GT3 cars will use the entirety of the Mistral, you just see the chicane they go past, that's uh, brought into play for GT4 and for GT2, which raced yesterday, and the Grunt and Go Mustang lines up the Mercedes AMG there, and Fred Verbeek looked personal best, but more significantly an absolute best for the Mustang. Huge rear wing draped off the back of it, like the sort of swan's neck, and he comes now up towards Lobose. They've only got the one car, so in terms of data, they're limited on what they can learn. You know, teams with three, four, five more cars, more data, more quickly. So the development will be at a given pace. Middle sector right now, and this car is quickest of the entire field. Raffaele Marcello, likewise, on the opening lap, he's fastest overall in that opening sector, but not as quick as Berfiche in the middle sector. That I find not just interesting, but fascinating, because we were talking to Fred Verbeesh yesterday, he said we've still a lot of work to do to get this car to handle. Maybe he's thinking about his Audi days when the car would turn on a dime. A mid-front engine car isn't going to do that, but this is going to be a good run from the Ford Mustang. Second Whoa. in this sector, in this Q2, that's pretty impressive. Really good stuff, and then instantly gets bumped to third because Max Hoffer goes ahead of him. But Marco Mappelli, in the same car that topped Q1, topped Q2, and has gone two tenths quicker than Franck Pereira. You can understand that because it's lighter. You can't refuel, so the cars get lighter and lighter across Q2 and 3. So Mappelli, 153.047, is now the fastest in Q2. And Marcello goes second then in the BMW, number 46, 153.122. Yeah, and that's, we haven't really seen much of Raffaele Marcello through the weekend, and that's more representative of what he's capable of doing. We've got an Aston Martin, up the 35 Aston Martin, up into third place. So Roman Leroy has done a good job indeed for the brand, and that's, the, again, the first time, I think, since we arrived here Saturday morning that we've seen Aston Martin at the front of a... Well, this is Q2. So there... there Nicolas Giro, sorry, John, just to get the yeah. Ferrari up towards the, the uh, end of the lap at Virage de la Tour. So, Lamborghini, BMW, and Ferrari now third. David Rigon up to third fastest. And we're talking there in terms of Q2. On the aggregate, you've got Lamborghini number 163 from BMW number 46. And third, another Lamborghini, because on the average, Matteo Cairoli, 10th in this session, his car is third on the combined times. That's Fabi and Schiller in number two Mercedes, currently a long, long way down the times in Q2. And Dan Harper, look, has done an absolute best in the first sector. And surprise, surprise, in the BMW. Yeah. But this car, I had expected this to be certainly a challenge for pull position, but we're not seeing the pace. And Fabian Schiller was a personal best in sec first and second sectors. Where will he end up? Well, he moved forward substantially, yeah. fourth in this session. So that puts the Mercedes fourth in the combined times. That's Dan Harper, reigning British GT champion, Carrera Cup GB champion, Ginetta Junior champion, very, very quick little driver. Uh, BMW factory driver, having been a BMW junior. Uh, Max Hesser, who was also a junior, now factory driver, joins him and Augusto Farfus in this car. And Dan Harper coming up to the end of his first flying lap. And after all the good sectors, he's backed out of it by the look of it because of traffic ahead. Yeah, he, he caught up to the tail of the Aston Martin very quickly and he realised he was going to be compromised. So he's going to have to go again, having had a fastest overall in sector one and a personal best in sector two. And that's again much the same we saw from Maxime Martin in the 46 BMW in the opening part of uh, qualifying one. 
uh, Fabian Schiller that we were talking about in number two Mercedes is fastest in Q2 to put the car fifth on aggregate. That is Matteo Cairoli, who is now second both in Q2 and on aggregate. So it's a Lamborghini 1-2 on the grid provisionally, the 163 from 63. And here, 22 Porsche. This is Laurin Heinrich at the wheel. This is the car that we saw Ian Schuguven drive in Q1. And Laurin Heinrich, who two years ago was Carrera Cup Deutschland champion, another Porsche specialist, looking pretty good, although he's dropped a little bit of time in that middle sector. Yeah, and coming off the centre as well, he ran a little bit wide and ran over some of those sort of dimple-like curbings and the car got a bit unstable but nevertheless a quick quick driver in a quick quick car and number 163 which is the car on pole position provisionally Marco Vapelli uh, under investigation for a pit stop infringement and number 19 the sister Grasser car under investigation for a pit stop infringement so the stewards are going to be busy three minutes on the clock just over as the cars dive down towards turn one who else is looking racy? Well, this is Ross Gunn in the Valkenhorst Aston Martin. David Pittard did Q1 in this car, and Ross Gunn comes out of Cena using all of the racetrack. And of course, Ross Gunn familiar with the Aston Martin brand racing in, in North America over the last season or more, so expect something special from this young British driver. Is he personal best? Again, that middle sector seems to be the sector that people struggle in now coming up to the conclusion of the lap it's closing back up to the tail of the 90 mercedes and oh this got pit into the pit so that's not a problem for ross gun so what can he do is the car is 12th overall so through goes Ross Gunn and up one place up to 11th overall. I'm looking forward, if we can do it at any part of the race, to Ross Gunn and Michele Beretta going toe to toe. That will be an arms race probably between the two. Right, Davide Rigon goes through, 51 Ferrari, and is seventh in Q2. So we've got a Mercedes top in this 15 minute segment. You've got Lamborghini 1 2 on aggregate. This is where the fascination comes a quick car. But yes, you've got to have quick drivers. And of course, in, in terms of, uh, let's say, the bronze, where you can have, yes, a bronze driver, but even up to a platinum, of course, it's going to be quicker in some sessions than others. And we talked that on the grid at Spa last year. So here's the battle between the drone and the 51 <laughs> Ferrari. And... Oh, the Ferrari, just that little bit quicker. I think it's got better drive off the corner. So uh, the drone couldn't quite get a toe. Anyway, back to the land-based cameras as the Ferrari makes its way down almost halfway down this, just a kilometre along Mistral Strait. Yeah, Davide Rigon, you always expect great things from. Interestingly, though, with less than two minutes to go, a number of cars now heading into the pit lane. They've bailed. Uh, they're doing that driver change, ready to get the incoming driver for Q3 settled in the car, get him comfortable, get the new tyres on. 32, then, the uh, BMW. Dries van Thor, Charles Weert, Sheldon van der Linde's car. It is Sheldon at the wheel of it. It's sixth on the aggregate time at the moment. But it's only 26th in Q2, would you believe? Well, they've got the slap to complete, but he hasn't got any greens. And um, that first sector is 0.3 of a second down. Middle sector is a very small difference. But this lap in itself isn't going to do very much to consolidate their overall positions between the first and second qualifying but he's got time for one more lap, and if the road's getting quieter with more people pitting, this might play into the hands, mightn't it, of Sheldon van der Linde, because, look, he's got a nice bit of pit straight that's clear ahead of him. Looking down from the drone, goes under the Fanatec gantry, under the lights, under the footbridge, and clear real estate all the way down towards turn one. If the tyres are prepared to play ball here, this could be a good lap. Well, he's certainly got a clear racetrack. That's one of the, the sort of fundamentals. So that last lap didn't do anything in terms of changing the overall position or this qualifying sessions position so let's eavesdrop okay p4 sweeping charlotte van der linde being told what he needs to do to find fourth place in the times and accelerating towards now the mistral straight now interestingly contact has been noted between this car Ooh. And 111, the Arthur Rougier, Roman Carton, Adam Etecki, Audi. Flag, flag. And it was at turn 14. So that's coming through the last couple of corners through the Village de la Tour. So uh, this car's had an incident which might also be just ever so slightly affecting its setup. Yes, we don't know how much 
let's have a look and see here we go oh, oh yeah oh wow. yeah well that was the, the i he backed off and that, that wrong-footed sheldon van der linde mm. he didn't expect that so the damage to the front would be around the splitter so whether that has been compromised or not it's difficult to see unless you get a really good well it looks like the splitter hasn't been damaged and uh, there's not really very much bodywork damage to the BMW whatsoever. What's the damage to the Audi? We don't know. The, around the rear of the car is vulnerable. The diffuser area in particular. But van der Linde's on it. He's got a personal best sector one. He's fractionally down sector two. And in this session, this car should move up from its present 26th position. And whether that will make a difference to the overall between the two sessions, we'll wait to see. Over the timing line comes Sheldon van der Linde. And he will... Be sixth goes through. Q3 will start at 10:35. That's in just under seven minutes' time. Therefore, Messi Alamba, race director. Now, is that car going to need any running repairs? There you go into the WRT garage. But Valentino Rossi is going to do Q3. That is a real badge of honour for him, isn't it? Because Q3 is when you need your absolute gun in the car. They're at their lightest. There's a bit more rubber on the road, and as he gets himself ready for Valentino Rossi to do Q3, that's quite something. What he's doing with his race overalls is what motorcyclists do with their leathers. Yes. Because the leathers are so tight. Uh, because you, you, you move around in the seat on a motorbike, but he's, that's, that's one of the habits he's not gotten rid of. Yeah, exactly. It yeah, I mean, makes me laugh watching him do it. But that illustrates, doesn't it, how now Valentino is a GT racer. He's not a motorbike racer in a GT car. If he's doing Q3, if he is deemed by the team to be the man you can put your money on for the good time at the end, that's, that shows you how far he's come. Uh, yes, I mean, it's an interesting de decision. One would have assumed that they would have had Valentino in the middle session and had Mar Marcello take the final session, but the team have chosen to go down this path and uh, the car will be at its lightest. So it gives Valentino a very good opportunity to go out and show just the world that he's not any longer. Let's just go back to 32 and eavesdrop on the radio traffic. Hey, check it flag for us, check it flag. Yeah, that's good. I'm qualifying. That's first now. I think we've gone over then. Okay, mate. Understood. Understood. Um, what happens now? Uh, so conversations between Sheldon and Linda and the engineers but he will give that car over to Charles Wirtz for Q3. So we're about, what, five minutes just under away from getting things underway as the BMW... Actually, considering the impact with the Audi, it doesn't look that damaged at all, does it? You, you would have to have seen the replay to know it had been in any sort of scrape at all. I mean, we had a look at the car on track, and you could see it was the left front of the, the BMW that more or less got into contact with the rear of the Audi, but there's nothing, not even any... I mean, th th these cars have got a, a vinyl wrap on them, they're not painted. So let's look at it again. Yeah, it just caught the, the, the left rear of the Audi as it was backing off and Sheldon van der Linde was on it coming around, so just nowhere to go. The Audi, according to the message line on the timing data we have, uh, is now under investigation for uh, blocking, which is interesting. So car 111 under investigation for blocking. Right, so now this is the aggregate order, the combined order. Uh, Front Pereira and Marco Mapelli's efforts, putting them ahead of Andrea Caldarelli and new to Lamborghini for this year, Matteo Cairoli. My ancient Gouven and Larin Heinrich are up to third. Car Maxi triple Martin. three under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. Raffaele Marcello with him. Lucas Stoltz, Fabian Schiller, fifth. You'll go on to come. Uh, you can see in the column for the third driver there who will go next. And some big names then to try and fight it out for pole position. The Rover Racing BMW was only 11th. That's going to be uh, one to watch. And further down, who else might you be anticipating to uh, make up some progress? Well, certainly the uh, Ferrari is always worth watching. Lewis Williamson for Two Seas Motorsport. Patrick Kuyla for Barwell. Uh, they'll be worth keeping an eye to. Sandy Mitchell, likewise. So a lot to shake out of qualifying yet with a further 15 minutes to come. The race, just to remind you, is going to be 3 o'clock local time. We'll be on our half an hour before that with the build-up to the race. But right now, Lamborghini quickest on the aggregated times, courtesy of uh, Front Pereira and Marco Mappelli. And the Lamborghinis have been kind of sleepers over the weekend. They've looked quick on occasions, but now, come race day, they've, they've delivered thus far. Well, I mean, it's the same old story. Teams that are familiar with their car, which 
uh, grass racing is. They know what they've got to do in those that free session on Saturday morning, then the pre-qualifying session. They're just going through a job list of let's get all the drivers through, let's get the car working in a way that suits all three drivers, do our homework, essentially. And then when it comes down to going out and having the out and out blast and qualifying, they're confident in what they have. They can get out and do it. And there is the Ford Mustang, Dennis Olsen on board. And I think it's done a pretty good job in its first event. So wait to see where they will end up overall on the grid. I suspect there's going to be somewhere in that mid-grid pack. Uh, but with three strong drivers in the lineup, this is the experience that they bring to the Ford Mustang team. That's going to be the strength, I think, when it comes to the three hours later today. So the engineers making sure the drivers are set, ready for this third part of qualifying. And when we do get underway, this is going to be the one that determines the grid. This is perhaps more than ever uh, where you need to make sure you're not bouncing over curves and exceeding track limits. And uh, then there is just time to get everything sorted for a three-hour race. It's going to be an interesting type of race here, isn't it? In as much as it's going to be shorter than the last few years of Paul Ricard. And it will, in theory, all be daylight. Yes, and also it's at a much earlier time in the year. So the ambient and track temperature is going to be that bit lower as well. So it's an interesting... you know deviation from the, the norm we've had at Paul Ricard over the previous seasons. And yes, it's, I think it's, it's going to be, let's say, less predictable than the six hours would have been. Uh, and of course, the experience that the teams enjoyed by coming here, usually at the end of May, early part of June, as a run into Spa 24, which now is at the end of June, used to be the end of July. So it gives the teams an opportunity to develop their car but they're not getting that opportunity to have the nighttime running, which I think they valued a lot. Dorian Boccalacci will take the Schumacher CLRT Porsche out for this session. And 15 more minutes, a bit more rubber will have gone down. And uh, as you heard Valentino Rossi talking about earlier on, this is when the uh, cars are going to be at their Green fastest. flag, green flag. We're on fuel. Green flag waved from the pit lane. The instruction from race control. So lighter on fuel, new tyres, bit more rubber on the road. And let's see whether we come out the other side of this. Still with the Lamborghini as the fastest car. So Maxi Goetz in the Butzen VDS Mercedes. Again, a change of manufacturer for the Belgian-based team. Tressa Racing. Great lineup. Ricardo Feller. Christopher Hasser, Alex Acker, that's a car, again, that you have to put into your top ten, you know, top five grid positions. Slowly, slowly, the pit lane is waking up. Yes. A single car trundles down at 50 kilometers per hour, and it is 50. 50.1 50 is an infringement. It is indeed. But we're in business, and the road will get busier over the course of these 15 minutes then, as gradually people are tempted out. There's number 19 that had that spin earlier on, and uh, that car now should be in the hands of uh, Haitham Quarajoli, the Q80 driver. It is. He goes out with Sam de Jong as Aston Martin on track as well. 159 from Garage 59. And now Tom Gamble, McLaren factory driver. Outside our window, looking all a bit ominous, heading our way is a drone which will be picking up cars, uh, leaving the pit lane, no doubt, with its camera in a moment. Robert Renard, who is the man behind Herbert Motorsport with his twin brother Alfred, he will go in 91 Porsche. So all the teams working to a plan, they know when they want to release the cars. Well, essentially what they're looking at is sending the car out towards the end of the session, a flying lap, and that second flying lap, assuming that you've not over abused your tire on that opening lap. So ultimately you're looking at two flying laps and then bring it back in. So traffic permitting, that's the plan, but things don't always go to plan. True, true, true. There's a car which had great success within the Endurance Cup last year. Having won at uh, Monza, having won at Spa. Marco Wittmann 
for Rover Racing. We'll do Q3. <laughs> and the drone is heading past our window. It's a bit weird. The, the drone is the spy in the sky. Yes. And uh, normally we don't have spies looking into our comedy <laughs> position, but right now we're being spied upon. You better stand up, John. Just, you know, you're being watched. Uh, and the other side of the pit lane, there you can see the cars. Uh, we're based on top of that building, that row of little booths with a few people stood in front. We're in one of those, in case you were wondering. Drivers in the pit lane, psyched up, ready to go, thinking through the lap. And we'll leave the pit lane on instruction. You're looking into the Comte you, uh, Aston Martin. That's the Nicholas Bar, Esteban Mert, Sebastian Ogard car. And this is the Sky Tempesta Ferrari, number 93, which Chris Froggart is behind the wheel of. So coming up to completion, I'm assuming this is of an outlap. Yeah, we, be, didn't, yes. we yes. didn't see this car leave amongst the earlier levers. So Chris Froggart about to now exit turn 14, nail it all the way down. It's, it's quite a long pit straight also into turns one and two. And so the Ferrari trips the timing light now and off it goes. A clear route ahead and a good opportunity for Chris Froggart to get in at least one lap without having to compromise or be affected. Slightly wobbly there coming through the exit of turn one. Jump the curb and now down the hill. It turns three and four, the Verage L'Hotel and into five at Verage du Camp. I think Chris Froggart's quite happy being back in a Ferrari. He did enjoy the McLaren last year, and it took him to the bronze championship in Endurance Cup. But it was in Ferraris that he had so much success in the one mate championship and then in his early days of uh, GT3 racing. So it's a bit like going home, isn't it, that? I think you shouldn't have a favourite brand or favourite manufacturer, but it's just some things about one or other may just be that Chris Froggart feels that the Ferrari was the car, the manufacturer that gave them that initial success when they ran the 488 now they've got the ferrari the 296 which is a, a v6 twin turbo as opposed to the v8 twin turbo of the 488s and the 458s so frog at personal best first and second sectors you'd expect that because it's his first flying lap he had a purple sector in sector one but that's now been eclipsed uh by i'm just looking to see it's just changing all the time the purples are popping up all over the place so it's the 66 Lamborghini that's got that. Uh, I'll say, how do you make it on this? It's uh, yeah. D Dylan Pereira. Sam de Jonga, after his accident yesterday morning, has just set a benchmark time here of 155.7, but we're looking at a 153. Really, now a high 152 as the best lap because it was a 53.2 in Q1 from Pereira. It was a 53.0 from Apelli in Q2. So we really need to be in the 52s now with a lower fuel load to, to see the proper pace of the cars. Uh, Audi number 66 here coming up towards the timing line. That car from the Trezor Attempto Racing Stable, Andre Mukovals, Max Hofer and Dylan Pereira. And Pereira goes across the line to be fastest, 153.6. He's another driver that made his name in Porsches initially, but uh, very quick in the Audi. Right, so the road is getting busier. Get your ears ready, because the Mustang blasts towards us. There it is. And Dustin Blattner going rapidly in his Porsche, the Rutronic racing car. Klaus Graf's team, or Klaus Graf managed team, himself a very good sports car racer and single-seater racer of years past. Dustin Blattner from if you like, club-level Porsche racing, came to the Intercontinental GT Challenge in Abu Dhabi at the end of last year, now to a full season of Fanatec GT Endurance, and he's looking good. Looking very good, indeed, that middle sector, excellent. But again, against that final sector is coming into turns 14 and 15, where his time will have been compromised, maybe a personal best, and it goes in this session, the second quicker. So a good effort indeed from Blattner and the 97 Porsche. And up to second is another of the Astons, Lorcan Hannafin, uh, who was very, very quick years ago. You might remember in Janetta Junior racing in the UK and Carrera Cup GB. Then he went to Carrera Cup Deutschland and into uh, international sports car racing last year. Well, he's gone second. And Rob Bell, 2016 champion, might well be on to go fastest for Optimum, number 27, uh, McLaren, with an absolute best and then a personal best for Rob. There you've got 48 Mercedes, which is Lucas R at the wheel, ahead of a rapid Chris Froggart. And he wants all this traffic to get out of his way. Gets up the inside of the Mercedes, which does let him go, in fairness. Yeah. So Mercedes pulled over, saw the Ferrari coming. So it doesn't matter how. Yep. 
It doesn't matter how slow you are into the final turn, it's how quick you come off it. And you just saw as he came over the line, the driving standards flag being shown to 93. So that's for track limits for Chris Frog at the lap will stand. And he did do a 153.7. Pereira is still the quickest. Dylan Pereira, not to be confused with Pereira in the heat of battle. Rob Bell goes fourth. And number 36, Aston Martin there going through. That is now Ben Green at the wheel of it. Another very, very quick British driver who was one of the stars a couple of years ago in the ADAC GT, the German GT Championship. But uh, he hustles on, but he's now got the dreaded traffic ahead of him then, so that's going to go against the third of the Valkenhorst Aston Martins. He's going to have to bail this lap, I fear, because although he's done an absolute and a best, he just can't clear the traffic. No, that's always... A... So coming up to this last part of the racetrack, turns 14-15. As we look at the 9-9-8. So Max Hasse behind the wheel and got personal best and fastest, significantly fastest in that second sector. So that BMW, and that has gone quickest overall in the final sector of qualifying, segment of qualifying. So great fit, 153, 170, and that's not been beaten by Sven Muller in the Porsche 96. Who is 39 thousandths up, we're not quite into the 52s, that was a 153.1, but we're knocking on the door of it, a 152 lap is in the post, I think, Enrique Chavez was quickest earlier on, and look at him go now, another absolute best, he was another of the standouts last year, uh, but Enrique Chavez now switches teams, switches brands, the absolute best has been bettered by the BMW of Max Hesse, but this could still be a good lap by Chavez. You can see he's just dropped a place in the overall standings because others have improved. Sandy Mitchell is up to third in Q3 in Barwell Lamborghini number 78. And now Mirko Bortolotti goes fastest. So another Lamborghini topping the times. It's a 152.9 for Bortolotti. We're into the 52s as Enrique Chavez comes to the end of the lap. And it's happening all round. We see Max Hesse in the 998 BMW Passes overall sector one, drops a lot, or more or less, drops what he had gained in sector two. And got just over five and a half minutes of the session to go. Last time we had a Lamborghini on pole position outright was Nürburgring 2021. White flag, meaning there's a very slow moving car up the road. Haven't seen which it is. Have gone past our window, I would have thought, if he was slow on the pit straight. There is Max Hesse, who did do an absolute best in the first sector. He's lost a little bit of time in the second sector, though, and comes now towards the end of the lap. So Bortolotti, 152.9, the only driver today to get into the 152s. What can Max Hesse do? He's down to third. It's Bortolotti, Muller, Hesse, Mitchell, Boccalacci, and then Louis Prep within Q3. And 163 Lamborghini there. This is the car that had pole position earlier on. He's back right out of it. Yeah, he's just looking for a bit of clear air. And as he backs out, then he gets a line of cars to be behind him. So whether he now gets back on the throttle and tries to... He doesn't want to let more cars pass because that's only going to further inhibit his progress. Uh, yeah, Christian Engelhardt, I should have said, was in 163. Mirko Bortolotti, we've established, is the fastest driver and he could go quicker again. Look, two personal bests. Jules Gounon is up to third in Q2 and third on average, and that was with an absolute best in the last sector. So number two Mercedes is back at the races. Engelhardt's now done an absolute best in sector one. And what can Bortolotti do? It was a 52.948. He breaks the beam at a 52.7 to go even quicker. Very impressive indeed from Mirko Bortolotti. That is a good time on 52.775 and consolidates the performance that he saw or gave just a few minutes ago. As you're going to personal best, but losing three tenths of a second in that middle sector. So I don't know where that time has gone. Sven Muller in the Porsche, personal best and personal best. That car, in this session, fourth quickest overall. So Jules Gounon, we know what a star he is, and different combination of drivers around him this year. Of course, last year in endurance, it was Jules, it was Rafael Marcello and Timo Bogoslavski, who's uh, not in endurance cup this year. So Jules Gounon with, uh, for this season, Fabian Schiller, and also with Lucas Stoltz. Still a very, very good combination of drivers. Uh, but the bright yellow Mercedes thunders up towards the line. So good in sector one, not so good in sector two. Net result as he goes across the line, stays third. Uh, the lap time was fractionally better, 152.990. That gives us now three drivers in the 152s. Portolotti, best lap of the day. 
Sven Muller's Porsche doesn't improve, stays 12th. Valentino Rossi, in case you're asking, 35th in this isolated part of qualifying. Yeah, didn't he get that way, that warning flag? We saw it on the top of the screen with 46 against it. So something Valentino did, whether that was a time deletion. It was, yes, cancellation of his lap. Yeah. So yeah, you're quite right, John, well spotted. So Valentino has had a lap taken off him. And that's the danger, because that's the one you're all hooked up, then you've got to go again, but the tyres have lost their peak. Jules Gounon onto the Mistral straight. Let's listen. Last lap was two tenths lower than the previous one. So that's not the new Jules Gounon wanted. No, not on the, the last thing you're out there driving your heart and soul out <laughs> for the team to tell you. Uh, oh, you're down on lap time from your previous lap. I think a, a driver will know whether he's quicker or slower because just what he, information he gets through the car will indicate whether it's one one corner or whether it's a sequence of corners. But Jules Gounod always got so much information, knowledge of a Mercedes AMG GT3 that he knows precisely where the car is quick or not. And here's an example. I mean, he's doing nothing wrong. He's just running close to the tail. Is that the 32 BMW directly ahead? I can't quite work it out. Might be the century car, but you're right, it's a BMW. BMW. And I think Jules is going to have to back out of this lap and pit. Yes, he was quicker than he had been in sector one. His dad's meant to be coming here this weekend to cheer him on uh, with his younger son, Jean-Marc. What did he say? 60 years of age now. Uh, and Jules' biggest concern on Friday was whether he should shave or not, because his father was coming and his dad doesn't like Jules having a beard. Oh, dear. First oh world dear, problems. Oh, yes. oh well. <laughs> There we are. Anyway, Bearded racing drivers, John, used to be a thing. A beard, well, beards have come back into fashion. It seems that in general in society, beards are back in fashion. Anyway, just under a minute remaining, so those on this lap will be able to complete it. Bouncing over the curb there is last year's Le Mans 24 hour winner, Alessandro Pierguidi, who's very versatile in his ability to switch from hypercars to GT3 machinery and back again. He comes up to cross the line and 10th fastest in the Ferrari out of the AF Corsa stable. So as John says, into the last minute, that is Ricardo Fella, last year's sprint champion with Mattia Drudi. Drudi has gone the Comte Aston Martin route to join Marco Sorensen and Nicky Tim, but Ricardo Fella uh, still on the Audi Sport payroll. Even though there isn't necessarily a, an Audi Sport program as such, there are still some drivers on the payroll who have been placed with teams for one more season and Christopher Hauser and Ricardo Feller given to uh, Alex Arca's father, Arkin Arca's team for this year. Flag Chick is out. flag, chick flag. Well, it's been a Lamborghini morning, hasn't it? So Mirko Bortolotti, 152.775. Uh, different Lamborghini from that that had topped the times in Q1 and 2, but that's given the opposition quite a lot to think about, I would have thought, because the Lamborghini brand, uh, like I said earlier, was a bit of a sleeper yesterday, but they've clearly been on the espresso this morning, the Italian engineers, because they've got the cars working very nicely indeed. And in Q3, number 32 BMW, John. Well, looking at Eve Verts's face, that's the father of Charles Verts in the WRT garage, there was a look of concern, I mean, that is not where one would normally assume to see the 32 WRT entered BMW, so... And, and what had been in Q1, a, a sort of like a, a, a BMW domination in the early phase, now the BMWs are split all the way down through the field from best as Max Hess's 998 car, in this session I'm talking about, not overall, all the way down to Valentino, who is 35th in the number 46, but having lost his time, must have been a track limit violation, uh, that's he didn't get a second run, didn't get a, enough left in the tyre, I suspect. But on aggregate, that car is still fifth fastest, yeah. so uh, it, it averages out. You can have a bad qualifying, but your co drivers save you. Mirko Bortolotti's pole position, incidentally, extends his endurance pole record. That now gives him 10. Uh, and as I say, it's a record that he's just extended over everybody else. So Mirko Bortolotti. Uh, takes a 10th pole position, yes, with a bit of help from others, because that car is shared by Andrea Caldarelli and Matteo Cairoli, so they put themselves in the box seat for the race. Raffaele Marcella looks pretty content with life. The BMW up at the pointy end of the grid. Became a dad, what, about a fortnight or, or so ago, if that, and had to abandon the family to go to race at Alton Park, briefly back home to change nappies, and then on to Paul Ricard. Yeah, it looks very relaxed, but sometimes he looks... Mm. But, he normally had his serious face on most race weekends, but there you can see him very comfortable and very relaxed, enjoying his sort of debut for the WRT BMW team. 
yeah, part of that BMW factory program this year, uh, a Curtis ASP with whom he had great Mercedes AMG success in Fanatec GT. Uh, not in th this championship this year, moving elsewhere with Lexus, but uh, still here running cars in GT2. There then is the car that will start from pole position. Mirko Bortolotti, Matteo Cairoli, uh, and Andrea Calderelli, the drivers. This is the Iron Lynx run car, as you can see, as opposed to the Grasser Racing Team uh, entry that was quickest in Q1 and Q2 of Pereira and Marco Mapelli. Christian Engelhart, the third driver in number 163. But even so, you've got some very competitive cars uh, out of different teams all up at the sharp end of the grid. Now, there are various things that the stewards might need to have a look at, so the order for the grid is still somewhat provisional, uh, but with 54 cars set to do battle at 3 o'clock local time, what's that, only four hours or so away, uh, it's going to be a really, really good start to the season. We call this the Endurance Cup, but really it's a three-hour sprint. Yes, three, three one-hour sprints, in fact, but mm. um, there are three-hour sprints as right. Let's hear from our three drivers of the pole position car then. Antonio Rankin is with them. Well, guys, what a mega team effort. I'll come to you first. That lap seems to come from nowhere. <laughs> well, I think, um, yeah, I'm pretty happy. It's been a great lap, great quality for us. Uh, both my teammates also had great laps. So it's a team effort in the end of the day. Otherwise, you can't be on pole in uh, such a competitive championship like uh, GT World Challenge Endurance. So it's great after, you know, uh, kind of a tough season last year where the pace was always there, but the results really never suit us. Um, I think it's great to come back with a strong result this morning, but still, the three hour race is this afternoon, so we're going to focus on the race now and try to get the result home. Brilliant. And do you think that this will translate into race pace for you? Yeah, that's the aim for sure. I mean, I, we know that we have a strong package. I mean, uh, I mean, teammates and, and car, it say it's on a good level, so the goal is clear for today. I think we, 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 can, we can do it. I mean, as long as we keep the car on track, no mistakes, and have a clean race, I think we, we can make it. But really happy how, how it did ended up the qualifying. Um, it was my first uh, real quali qualifying with the Huracan GT3 and we are on pole, so I cannot ask for a better result. Of course, with it being your first quali, how are you finding the Lambo? Well, uh, pretty different compared to what I was used, but I mean, it's such a, a great car and uh, we know that the potential is there, so it's going to be challenging today, but at the same time, we, we are ready to fight. Absolutely. And finally, Andrea, it's a capacity grid, very, very busy out there. What's your strategy going to be? Starting from the front can't hurt. Yeah, for sure it doesn't hurt. Uh, at one point we will eat traffic anyway, we know that. But uh, it's a three-hour race, so we, we, we know what, that we have to stay out of trouble. That's the first thing, uh, knowing what happened last year in this race. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's li literally the strategy is stay out of trouble, uh, be careful with truck limit and uh, try to, to finish what uh, we just did this morning. Absolutely. Great start to the weekend. Best of luck. And the point that Andrea Calderelli makes about uh, the uh, keeping out of trouble is absolutely essential because in the races yesterday, GT2, GT4, there was always fun and games at Turn 1. If you can survive the first half of the first lap, then you can start to think about getting into a rhythm and concentrate on that first hour pretty much before you need to uh, work out your ideal pit stop strategy. Valentino Rossi reflects on the session as he talks to Maxime Martin, who is uh, back to us. And I think arms folded, you'll find on the other side, is Raffaele Marcello. Yes, he is. But uh, again, that's a card that you should not rule out. We've been saying over the course of qualifying, the list of potential winners is a very, very long one. And BMW number 46 has had a sprint win, of course, but not an endurance win. That could change. So this is the provisional grid order. So it is Andrea Calderelli, Matteo Cairoli, and Mirko Bortolotti's Iron Lynx Lamborghini ahead of the Einstein Guven, Larin Heinrich, Dorian Boccalacci, Porsche. Luca Stoltz, Fabian Schiller, Jules Gounon third, with Franck Pereira, Marco Mappelli and Christian Engelhardt fourth, Augusto Farfas, Dan Harper and Max Hesser fifth, Maxime Martin, Raphael Marciello and Valentino Rossi sixth. Uh, in bronze, Adam Smalley, James Cottingham and Louis Prett on a class pole. In gold, Alfaisal Alzubar, Dominic Bauman and Mikhail Grenier on a class pole. And in silver, uh, it will be the car that is 17th uh, in Q3 provisionally, uh, but no, I'll tell you a lie, on the combined, it's going to be the Mad Panda Mercedes, Ezekiel Perez, Compank, and Patrick Assenheimer, uh, who are on the silver pole, from Colin Karasani, Dan Aro, and Tanat Safran Tirankul, with third, the car that was quickest in Q3 of uh, Aurelian Panis, Cesar Gazo, and Rui Mirahas. The one, of course, that didn't really get much lappery was Matt Bell, John Hartshorn, and Ben Tuck's Ferrari. That hopefully will be made good 
after its suspension damage after the contact with number 19 Lamborghini so that it can go from the rear of the grid. But it does give Matt and Ben particularly quite a lot of hard work to do. John Hartzell, uh, somebody we don't see much of in the uh, Fanatec GT world, but a very experienced sports car racer. And there is the Rover Pole Award, courtesy of Rover Oil. Stefan Rattel joins Mirko Bortolotti, Mattia Cairoli, and Andrea Calderelli as the winners of our new Rover Pole Award for the car, for the team that takes pole position uh, in a GT World Challenge Europe Endurance Cup round. So all smiles, thumbs up. Uh, that's a good start to the day for them. They are particularly keen to have trophies at the end of three hours of racing. Yeah, so I mean, the thing that the 63 Lamborghini needs to do, the things that the drivers can control are don't abuse track limits, but probably more critically, when the race gets into maybe mid-stage in the first hour. So when it comes to lapping some of the bronze drivers or some of the cars outside of your pro category, just give them that little extra margin because contact, you will be the liable party and that will lose you, potentially lose you a victory. Absolutely right. Looking back on qualifying, Front Pereira was the man to beat in Q1. In the Grasa Racing Team Lamborghini, the Mountain Wolf liveried car managed to find the optimum lap, and as the pit lane emptied with the AF Corsa Ferrari fleet making its way on track, so things got very busy indeed as the session became ever more important. Q2 being our first opportunity to uh, average out the times of drivers and Lamborghini's looking strong. Ultimately, it was this car, number 63 of Mirko Bortolotti, Marco Mappa, uh, Matteo Cairoli, I should say, and Andrea Calderelli that topped the time. Jules Gounod working his magic as the reigning champion in number two Mercedes to go up to third and fourth on aggregate, number 163. Christian Engelhardt not quite being able to find uh, a quick enough lap in Q3 to put the car on the front row of the grid, but it's looked really good thus far for Lamborghini. Sky Tempesta Racing Ferrari also quick, despite having a track limit warning. The uh, Almunar Racing Mercedes was another competitive car, and that in its class is going to be uh, one to keep an eye to over the course of three hours of racing. So we'll be on air at half past two local time, ready to go racing in Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup. We'll see you later. Bye for now.